Okay, hey, good evening, everybody. So glad you're with us. Uh, thank you for joining the uh, Facebook live stream here at the State Emergency Management Agency. We're coming to you from our headquarters in Jefferson City. My name is Jeff Briggs, and I am the Earthquake Program Manager for SEMA, and we're here today to talk about uh, the earthquake risk and here in the New Madrid Seismic Zone based in southeast Missouri. This is particularly important this time of year because I want to remind everybody to participate in a drill that Missouri does that lots of people do around the region. It's called the Shakeout Earthquake Drill. Uh, gosh, we have about half a million people participate every year just in Missouri, and so we're, we're had, glad you're here with us, and I hope you'll be interested in joining along with us. So today's session is going to be talking about the Shakeout and talking about why we need the Shakeout Drill. What do you know about the New Madrid Seismic Zone and the earthquake risk here in Missouri? A lot of people don't know about the earthquake risk, uh, don't even know that we have a seismic zone in this area, so we're going to talk about that a lot. So, let me start out by saying uh, thank you to uh, not, not only, uh, fortunately I'm not the smartest person in the room here tonight, Boot Pierce with the uh, geologist with the Missouri Geological Survey yep. is going to be joining me to answer the tough questions. Okay. The ones about the geology, what's going on underground, and, and what makes this a risky area, especially in southeast Missouri. And I also want to thank Katie Lubert, who is our uh, public information officer. She's behind the scenes, but she's the brains that makes it all work. She'll be monitoring our Facebook and making sure the stream works. And she will be letting us know about all the questions we get from you. I want to encourage all of you to submit your questions. We will be taking as many of them as we can live for as long as we're talking. All you've got to do is, uh, is leave your question in the comments section, and Katie will be sure to point them out to us, and me, or likely Boot, if it's a tough one, will be <laughs> handling those answers. So with that, let me, get, let me get things started. First, I want to tell you just briefly about the risk we have here in Missouri, and then I'll turn it over to, uh, to Boot to, to explain it in more detail. This map behind me shows it. Uh, here in Missouri, uh, we have the most, the historically, the most active um, seismic zone in the U.S. east of the Rocky Mountains, which a lot of people do not realize. We average more than 200 small earthquakes a year in the New Madrid seismic zone. Well, now, a lot of those are too small to be felt, but it certainly shows that there's a lot of activity going on. If you can see in this map, southeast Missouri, it's right down on the boot heel is where it's centered. It's about a 150 mile long stretch of a series of earthquake faults that make up the New Madrid seismic zone and it touches not only Missouri but also the states in that area, Arkansas and Tennessee and Kentucky and Illinois. A lot of people, several million people live in that area and they are all impacted by the potential for the New Madrid seismic zone. And we spend so much time talking about it, preparing for it here at SEMA for example, uh, because we know its history. Although we haven't had a large one lately, um, we know that historically there's a risk of a big, big earthquake here. A little over 200 years ago, in 1811 and in 1812, some of the largest earthquakes in the history of this country happened right here, centered in the little town of New Madrid down in the boot heel, caused an enormous amount of destruction. And that's why we know, that, and, the, and the geologists and the experts say, that an active seismic zone runs the risk of the large ones happening again. And that's why it's important that, uh, that we prepare, that we understand the risk, and why it's important that we do this shakeout drill every year. Now, I want to tell you about this. For those of you who are joining us live, fantastic. I, and I want to further encourage you to join us and tell your friends to join us while we're here because we're going to be doing some giveaways. Let's say this. For the first 100 people today during the live stream that, uh, that will uh, commit to me to sign up, for the shakeout earthquake drill, by the way, it's just a one minute drill, it happens October 15th. All you got to do is go to shakeout.org and register. Register yourself, your family, your school, your business, your professional organization, but register to join us. We've already got over 300,000 people signed up here in Missouri and a lot more to come. If you will join us to participate on October 15th and you will message us a screenshot of your completed registration. Well, then I'll give, I'll give you your choice. We got this really cool comic book, hot off the presses, called Without Warning. Neat story, talks about a family 
that goes through and suffers through an earthquake and responds to it. Really fun read, and we just got this. You can have that, or this is cool. I, every family should have one of these. If you don't have a battery, if you don't have a cell phone that works after several days without power after an earthquake, what are you going to do for light? Well, this baby, you crank it, and then you turn it on, and it's got light for as long as it goes. You don't need a battery for it. So this is great to have in an emergency. That's item number two. Or item number three, we've got a set of playing cards. Every single card's got a different earthquake preparedness fact on it. Fun to play with your family, and you can learn about earthquakes while you're playing cards. So sign up for the shakeout. Message us a screenshot of your completed registration, and you can tell us which of these three you want mailed to you, the playing cards, the flashlight, or the comic book. So I hope to hear from you. Now, let me turn it over to Boot for just a few minutes. Boot, maybe you can tell us a little more about what is going on underground in the seismic zone. So, Jeff, the, the pneumatic seismic zone is actually what is called a failed rift zone. So about 500 million years ago, at one point in time, the continent, the North American continent, was actually being rifted or stretched apart. And uh, it, it never actually pulled apart, but what is happening is as it, as it rifted, it pulled all, stretched all that rock apart, fractured it up, busted it all up. Now it's all settling back into itself. And so that's part of the part of what the seismic, the faults in the seismic activity is related to. So it's just, is it just one big line, 150 miles long, or is it a series of smaller cracks, or what's it actually look like down it, there? It's a series of small, of fracture, of, of more than one crack. If you look at the seismic zone, it actually starts down here in Arkansas, comes up, makes a dog leg, and then comes up, oh, kind of up the Ohio River, and then even goes up the western or the eastern side of Illinois. So it's it's definitely numerous faults, numerous numerous faults, and, and a long zone, not just one crack. Okay, thanks. So uh, so when we know there's a lot of cracks down there and there's a lot of activity, um, what happens, I guess, is when the shaking starts, and we feel and and believe me, when I go down to Southeast Missouri, and I know you do too, when you go down there and you talk to people and you say, have you felt a shake? Everybody down there sure. has felt a shake. Maybe not true in mid-Missouri so much or in other parts of Missouri, but if you're in southeast Missouri, as you know, everybody feels those sure. shakes. And what's surprising is, was surprising to me, is when you feel the big ones, the occasional bigger ones that happen, they're not just felt in southeast Missouri, are they? No, they're not. Uh, one of the things about the central part of the country is the rock is much more competent. So, so the energy from an earthquake actually travels farther. In the boot hill down there where we have the thick sediments, what happens is as the, as the energy moves through those sediments, the inner, it's actually amplified. So that's what makes, the, makes people be able to feel some of even the smaller of the earthquakes. What I'd heard was that in, in the West Coast, a lot of people know about the earthquakes on the West Coast, right? Sure. California, San Francisco, Los Angeles, they get more felt events than we do. Yes. But um, out there, I guess it's because of the nature of the rocks. They travel differently. An earthquake in Los Angeles area won't be felt hundreds of miles away, but it's different here. The, the range is wider, right? Correct. Correct. And in, in, in California, the rocks are much more busted up, fractured up. You're, on, you're, you're out there and you've got the mountain ranges. So when you have an earthquake, what happens is that that's allowed to absorb some of that energy. Here in the middle continent, we've got one, it's a large competent rock. And so when you shake it, it definitely the energy travels farther, the shaking travels farther away. And, and if I understand right, it travels along the rivers, along the wet, sand, sandy soil, right? Yes. How does that work? Well, one of the things that happens is when, it, when uh, it, earthquake waves are traveling, when they hit soft sediments, like the, the sediments of southeast Missouri, the boot hill, what happens is the waves become amplified. Same thing along the river channel, the alluvium along the river channel. Those waves become amplified, and so they, they travel up, up the, the river channels, up the Mississippi, the Ohio, those, those river channels there. So in a big, if a big one hits, like 200 years ago, how far away are people going to feel the shaking in these areas? So that, that kind of, we have to go back to history to, to kind of figure that out. Um, if we go back historically, 
you know, they talk about feeling the, the earthquake in Philadelphia, uh, Washington, D.C. That's really all that, that, that we can go by now is historical accounts uh, for, that, for that, those types of, but obviously a long way away. Yeah, and I know if it travels along the rivers and it's going to be felt, like for example, St. Louis, a couple hours away from the boot heel, but a big earthquake, St. Louis is going to feel it a lot, right? Correct. Correct, and especially um, they're, they're going to feel it. Um, they've done some some studies up there. You know, uh, liquefaction is something that they can expect to to occur up in in St. Louis area uh, up there as well. Yes. Okay, so you talked about liquefaction. Everybody knows, or, or you know, the the common notion is when the shaking starts, bricks are going to be coming off buildings. Sure. Damage like you know falling debris damage is what's understood. But liquefaction is, I think, something that a lot of people do not think about. But that is a real risk here, especially since we're along these riverbeds, right? Can you tell us what that is? So, so liquefaction, if, if um, liquefaction is essentially we have water saturated sediments. Um, you can think along the, the river channels where you have where you have river alluvium. Uh, you have river set. You have high groundwater tables. The, the sediments are saturated. When you begin to shake those. What happens is, is that they, the, the sand settles, water starts coming up to the surface, and it actually turns the upper portions of the, that sand, those sandy and gravelly materials, into essentially kind of a quicksand. And um, what happens is, is buildings will be, be, begin to kind of lose their structural integrity and begin to kind of sink down into them. Is that something you see on the West Coast as much? Um, they do see it out there where they do have alluvial, uh, again, it's, it's a function of thick alluvial sediments that are water saturated. Yeah. So, but not near as much, not near as, as what we would expect to see here in the Midwest. That's something you don't think about. And, and at SEMA, when we talk about preparing for these things, we've not only got to prepare for the power outage, the debris damage, but we got to talk about large swaths of the land that may turn into mush for a while and that are going to be awful difficult for people to move back into, so, right? Because this, how long is it going to stay mushy? Do you have any idea? I don't know if anybody has an idea of that. Obviously, liquefaction and flooding is, is, is thought to be a problem. It's uh, a geological problem that we would expect to see. Yeah. Huh. Okay. So now, now let, me, uh, let me talk. Uh, if this reminds me of something else. Okay. If you know that there's 200 earthquakes a year, and we know that historically we have some big ones. The obvious question is, it's been over 200 years since we had enormous ones. When are we going to have the next big ones? And I know you can't predict an earthquake, but what do you, how do you answer that question? So, so the U.S. Geological Survey is the one that are in, are in charge of studying this. And what they do is they look at, they look at in determining an earthquake hazard, they look at the, the past history, they look at the current history, they look at the probability of, as, and, and they come up with what they call a kind of a probability index. Uh, currently, the U.S. Geological Survey has a probability of, for a large earthquake, seven or larger, somewhere between seven and 10 percent chance in any 50 year, in any 50 year period. Uh, for a 6.0 earthquake, which is still considered a very, a very significant earthquake, um, it's somewhere between 25 and 40 percent in any 50-year period. The, the last 6.0 or higher earthquake that we had was in 1895. It was just north of Charleston, Missouri. Okay. Let me, let me remind everybody what we're doing. I know some people have probably joined us late, which is great. We're glad you're here. My name is Jeff Briggs. I am the uh, Earthquake Program Manager for the Missouri State Emergency Management Agency. Sweet. You're joining us here at uh, the SEMA. SEMA is our acronym, State Emergency Management Agency. You're joining us here at uh, SEMA headquarters here in Jefferson City. And I'm here talking about the ShakeOut earthquake drill and the earthquake history and the risk here in Missouri and in the whole New Madrid seismic zone. And I'm here with Boot Pierce, a geologist with the Missouri Department of Natural Resources. And I want to remind everybody that uh, the best thing we can do now to get ready is a ShakeOut earthquake drill. We talked about this a little bit ago, but in case you're just joining us, one minute drill it's happening on October 15th. We do it every year. About a half a million Missourians, just Missourians, join us every year. And we have millions throughout the Midwest. And in fact, it's a national, even international uh, earthquake drill in all the seismic zones around the world. We all come together uh, to practice. So now what we talk, if we talked about, um, um, as, Boot, as Boot was saying, 
uh, the earthquakes happen, but we can't predict it, right? The geologists have no way to predict it. So what do you do if you have a risk coming but that you can't predict? And that's kind of unique among risks that those of us here in Missouri face. We're used to seeing floods, and we have plenty of warning when floods are coming. It's raining a lot. The river bank, the river levels are going up. In tornadoes, and recent tornadoes is the other thing we think about quite a bit when we talk about natural disasters. But in recent years, we've gotten pretty good at predicting, and well, at predicting, we know we can see them with the modern technology we have now. And we've gotten pretty good about giving people at least a few minutes of advance notice to, uh, to seek shelter and to brace themselves for a tornado coming. Experts have not figured out how to help us out when it comes to earthquakes. Earthquakes occur without warning. It's unique in that way and it makes it uniquely difficult to prepare for it. And that's why the shakeout earthquake drill is so crucial because you have to know in an earthquake zone what to do before it happens. You're not going to have, uh, it, by the time the shaking starts, it's going to be too late to learn what to happen what to do. And that's what the shakeout drill is all about. We talk about a three-step process, and that's what we practice during this drill. It's a simple drop, cover, and hold on technique, which means drop to the ground before any shaking knocks you down, and cover up any way you can. If there's a table or a sturdy desk or something like that nearby, that's great. Drop and get underneath it. And then hold on to whatever's protecting you till it stops. So drop to the ground, cover up any way you can, if there's not a table nearby, at least cover up your head as best you can and hold on until the shaking stops. That's important because the experts tell us that in the U.S. and in other more developed countries, the most likely way that people get injured or even killed is because of falling debris. Um, and that's why we, get, uh, we, we want to prepare, a, know about drop cover hold on in advance and practice it in advance because we're not going to get warning. So now if we know the debris is the riskiest thing that's likely to get us, what can we do, again, in advance to minimize the chance that the debris is going to hurt us? So what we can do is look around now uh, in your environment, um, in your home, in your school, in your business, and look around and figure out what are the things that, if the shaking started right now, that might fall on us and hurt us. Um, a few examples, if there's a big, heavy, wobbly old bookcase, that would be great to move away from a doorway that might block you. It would certainly be great to move it away from your bed if, that, if it might fall on you while you're sleeping. Maybe it's you know, a simple little anchoring uh, brace that you can hook it to the wall so it won't fall. If there's a heavy object on a tall shelf, easy thing to do, move it to a lower shelf. If there's a big old heavy light fixture, maybe a big old ceiling fan right over your bed or right over where you spend a lot of time, uh, make sure it's well secured to the ceiling. You, you want to do all you can to avoid falling risks. That's what you can do to prepare that and know about drop cover and hold on. So let me remind you again, now that we know about how to prepare and about drop cover hold on, I want to encourage everybody to sign up for the shakeout. And if you do that tonight, I've got a prize. I got a present for you. You get to choose. The first 100 people. We, we don't have unlimited supplies of these, unfortunately. But the first 100 people who sign up and then send us a screenshot of their completed registration in, in, in a message, send us a Facebook message, get one of three things. You can get this comic book, story about a family recovering after an earthquake. You get this free deck of playing cards that has a different earthquake fact on every card or this cool battery-free flashlight. You simply crank it to give it some juice, pop it on. Great to have after an earthquake, for example, where you're going to be without power for several days and your phone's not going to last that long, your phone will run out of power. So if you're interested in one of these three items, message us with your completed ShakeOut registration picture and we will mail you one of these three items. Be sure and give us your address in the message. Am I saying that all right, Katie? We have a question. Yeah, we do have a question. Heather is asking, in the scenario of a big earthquake, how would it affect, say, the Lake of the Ozarks? Okay, the question from Heather, in a big earthquake, how would the Lake of the Ozarks specifically be affected? Thank you for that question, Heather. Boo, let me turn it over to you. So uh, the, United, the U.S. Geological Survey has produced uh, what they call a earthquake hazards. 
uh, map, and it's it's actually produced. Uh, we have one here at SEMA, or there have one, and so it gives kind of a scenario of where where damage can be expected or what kind of impact you would expect. I believe the Lake of the Ozarks is in a kind of a what they call a Mercalli intensity level of about five or six. So obviously there would be shaking that uh, would occur. And if I believe within a, a Mercalli intensity of five or six, uh, if you have uh, old types of unreinforced masonry buildings, sometimes chimneys like that can be can fall down. Obviously, plaster might crack and stuff like that, but, but the, the major damage that you would expect, say if you were in the boot hill or somewhere like that, would definitely be less as far as way uh, as Lake of the Ozarks. We have another question. Okay. Yeah, Heather okay. again, um, she asked about uh, Hannibal with the cave systems. How much damage would you expect there? Um, the cave systems are a little bit unique. There's been a lot of, lot of people trying to, to study how earthquakes impact caves. Um, and and I, I really don't know. Typically, the, the, the dead airspace uh, does not necessarily show the impacts of earthquakes that much. Hannibal obviously would probably be impacted a little more from the soft sediments along the river, more, more so than, than the, the harder bedrocks on the, on the sides. Okay, thank you, Boot. This brings up an interesting point. A question I get, and I know you get all the time, is people all over the state understandably say, well, I don't live in New Madrid. I don't live in the Boot Hill. I live here, there, everywhere. Where is it going to affect me? And I think it's interesting. If you look at these maps, and it talks about, and we'll talk a little more about magnitude versus intensity sure. a little later. Sure. But if you look at these maps, if a big earthquake hits like 200 years ago, there's going to be a lot of shaking and a lot of damage obviously in the southeast part of Missouri, sure. and quite a lot of southeast Missouri. But what's surprising to people is there's going to be a lot of shaking and a lot of damage following the rivers, right? Going all the way up to the river to St. Louis and even north of St. Louis, we expect to see so, damage. So that, that's that what area. the data from the U.S. Geological Survey seems to indicate, is yeah. that it's going to follow the rivers, the Missouri River and the Ohio River, up, up through those drainages because of those soft sediments. And that's, that's a big difference between here and the west coast. We do exactly. not see damages traveling that far. Correct. So that's why it's especially important for people to get involved in the shake out here in Missouri. A surprisingly large amount of the population is going to be impacted by a large earthquake. For example, if you live in the St. Louis area, expect to feel a lot of shaking and quite probably considerable damage as well. And Boot mentioned those old brick buildings, the unreinforced masonry. Uh, and St. Louis, downtown St. Louis, is absolutely loaded with those buildings. So, uh, and, and, and throughout southeast Missouri as well. Old brick buildings are a staple of the landscape in all these places, and they are the most at-risk facilities Correct. Uh, when that happens. Sorry, I didn't write a product Go ahead, another question, yeah, great. Yeah, we have another question. This is probably geared more towards Boot. So Megan is asking, um, she said she's noticed USGS in Nottoway County. What are they doing in that area? Repeat that question, please. Um, the question can... was that uh, Megan, Megan yeah. had noticed USGS in Nottoway County and was asking kind of what they were doing. That could be many, many different things. Uh, the US Geological Survey also takes uh, river level me measurements. So they may be setting up something to, to measure uh, stream gauges al along the rivers. Uh, they also do geologic mapping and other things. So, so they may be doing uh, a number of different things. Um, the U.S. Geological Survey is also, uh, they also have part of the biological survey. So it could be many, many different things. Just because they're there doesn't mean that it's earthquake related. Remind them where Nottoway County is. Uh, Nottoway County is in what, north, northwest Missouri? Yeah. I believe. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a while since I've been there. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Is that all the questions for now? Okay. Um, so we talk about preparation. Uh, we talked about how to prepare your environment before an earthquake happens because no, no warning. Um, well, it, we want to look for things that might fall on us in, in debris. And we know if we got things secured, we minimize the chance of things falling on us. And we know about drop cover and hold on then we've just greatly increased our odds of surviving an earthquake. Now, here's a question. What if, that's, that's if you're at your house or you're at your school, but what if you are asleep in bed? What do you do if you're asleep in bed? Uh, the best strategy that I think, because, and keep in mind, a lot of people will say, well, I want to uh, run outside, 
or I want to I want to run to the next room, something like that. When the shaking starts, running is just a bad idea. You see a lot of these clips with people panic and run, which I think is understandable because things are crashing all around them. But running greatly increases your chances of one, falling over, and two, getting hit by flying debris. So if you're in bed, the best thing to do is one, hopefully you've taken action now or before the shaking starts to secure things that might fall on you in bed. That's one. Two, if you're in bed and the shaking starts, the best strategy is just to flip over, cover your head up, and ride it out on the mattress because there's really nowhere else you can go and be as safe. The only exception, I had a little kid in the class one time tell me, what if I roll under my bed? So that's kind of a good idea. I'm too big to roll under my bed. Most <laughs> people are too big to roll under their bed, but maybe that's a bad, good idea if you're small enough to squeeze under that bed. Another common question is, what if I'm driving? Um, and this advice is different for an earthquake than it might be for a tornado, say. Because in a, in a, if you're driving and an earthquake starts, that car is good protection. Because again, it's the debris that's likely to put you at most risk. And in your car is meaning things, if you're in your car, things are not going to fall on you uh, in all likelihood. So the best strategy is if you're driving and the ground starts shaking, pull over safely and slowly to the side of the road. Try not to park under anything that might fall on you. Don't park under a bridge. Don't park under a telephone pole or a big tree. But pull over to the side of the road and just ride it out. That's the thing to do. Um, the, other, the other common question I get is what happens if, I know you told me to drop cover and hold on, Jeff, but what if I can't cover, what if there's nothing around me to cover up? What are you supposed to do? What if you're outside for a walk or in your big auditorium and there's nowhere to get down? You still want to drop cover and hold on. But if you can't cover under a table, cover any way that you can. Drop down to the ground, try to check and make sure you're not immediately underneath something that might fall on you, and then just cover up. Get on the ground and cover up as best you can and ride it out that way. What you never want to do is try to run because the running is what, what uh, historically we found is more likely to get people injured because they're going to fall over and they're going to get hit by something. So that preparation and knowing all the different options, I think is pretty important to do. Question, Katie. Yes, yeah, so it's more of a statement. Um, this is Eric, he says, we don't have earthquakes in Iowa, but maybe talk about why, just because maybe earthquakes aren't frequent in your area, why you should be prepared. The question is, we don't have, I'm sorry, I forgot the name. Yes, it is Eric, and he said. Eric, thank you, I got the question though. We don't though. have earthquakes in Iowa. Yeah, don't, don't have earthquakes in Iowa, but why is that, Eric wants to know. Um, a lot of it has to do, uh, why you don't have them basically has to do with the geology. Uh, one of the reasons to really be prepared is it's, it's probably a different level of preparedness. Um, obviously the states that are around Missouri, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, uh, they're going to be impacted as well because they're going to be, you're going to have a lot of people from the boot hill, from the area, just like in other natural disasters, trying to get out. Uh, and, and leaving. So you'll be most likely be impacted, but that'll be a secondary impact uh, just of people migrating out of the, of the damage zone, trying to get away from it, uh, and supplies coming into, into the damage zone as well. So it's definitely a different kind of, uh, a different kind of preparedness. Um, it's more of just trying to how, how to deal with the logistics of a disaster. And I'll tell you one other thing that's important for people from Iowa, for people from western Missouri, like Kansas City, for example. At SEMA, we worry a lot about how to get in and help people after a big earthquake. For people who are not, who are not directly impacted, boy, it's going to be really important that those people are aware of what's going on. Uh, we, we call on emergency responders and people like that to uh, come and assist us. The people that are impacted and in the heart of a damaging earthquake are really going to be worried about themselves and their family members trying to recover and take care of themselves, which is completely understandable. So we ask people that are on the outskirts of a major disaster to, uh, to be aware in case we need their help. We might need to bring supplies in. We might need to evacuate people and shelter people, things like that. So there's certainly plenty to do. Question. This next question kind of aligns with what you're already talking about. So Claire is asking if people will be without power for days, what sort of provisions and pre planning do you all recommend in case of an emergency? Okay, Claire is asking um, if we're going to be without power for days, 
What kind of preparations and planning do we need to take to prepare for the emergency? Great question, Claire, thank you. And preparation is key for earthquakes or for any disaster, really. But earthquakes are especially challenging because um, we, it could, we could be without power and water for days. In fact, there was a study done about 10 years ago that says, and keep in mind, 200 years ago, there weren't a whole lot of people living in this area, but now there are around 7 million people living in the impact area of a New Madrid seismic zone earthquake. The major metros of St. Louis and Memphis, Tennessee being where a lot of those people are. And uh, the estimate is that day one, after a big earthquake, we're gonna have more than two and a half million people without power and more than one million people without water. And that could extend for a long time because it's gonna be very difficult to respond to something that big. And the unique thing about earthquakes is that there are always aftershocks. So get ready to uh, be uh, without power and without water and perhaps be without assistance for quite a long time. So putting to the other provisions is really important. Uh, one thing I did want to mention that I, for, I think I forgot to mention when I was talking about preparation. Uh, one thing you can really prepare is if your house has a water heater, that's a great thing to strap to the wall, make sure it's secure. If a water heater falls down, not only have you just made a big mess of your water heater, but you have lost the easiest source of fresh water you have in your house for you and your family. So uh, securing a water heater is one great thing you can do now to prepare. In terms of emergency provisions, having kits ready that have a lot of uh, survival things in them, like this flashlight that you might win if you register for the shakeout. Um, supplies of water. The recommendation is one gallon of drinkable water per person per day for drinking and for sanitation. Um, provisions uh, that, that might include a blanket if it's a super cold day and you don't have heat. Um, excuse me, um, and, and other general first aid kits, um, bandages and emergency food and things like that, all important to have and to think about for earthquake or for any disaster. So thank you for that question. I have another one. This might be more for Boo. Uh, okay. This is Cindy. She's asking, how far into central Arkansas will the earthquake be felt? We feel tremors at least once a week. Uh, central Arkansas is uh, essentially part of the western edge of the Nevada seismic zone. Um, if you notice, uh, the zone starts right here, just north of, kind of northwest of Little Rock. So I know the, I know the state of Arkansas, their Arkansas Geological Survey is doing quite a bit of studies on, on, the, uh, on seismic activity in Arkansas as well. Uh, one thing that you mentioned earlier, Jeff, you mentioned aftershocks. And one of the things that the, when we go back and we look at the 1811, 18 12 earthquakes, uh, we can kind of get an idea uh, if we have something of that caliber again. Back in 1811, 12, there was over 15 earthquakes that were above a seven, uh, between a 6.5 and a 7.0. Uh, there was a, over 150 earthquakes that were between a 5.0 and a 6.5, and there was literally thousands of three and four uh, magnitude earthquakes. So. Uh, there's nothing that, if we look historically, that we, would make us think that maybe, possibly, <clears throat> if we see an earthquake or that type of system or today, that it would be something similar to that. So we may, it may be more than just one earthquake. That's one of the really difficult things that, that uh, comes when preparedness. Uh, you got to be careful you send everybody, all your staff in there to take care of everybody and then you have another earthquake and so so your your rescue people are now part of the in the middle of the earthquake so it's def, it's definitely something that has to be considered yeah thanks and those and those aftershocks don't just happen in this couple of days they can happen over weeks and months well, right correct i mean we went from from december of 1811 till march march and and april of 1812 so 5 months there in there and i if you read historical accounts from from Fuller, there was, there was earthquakes for a year or two afterwards. So. And that happens all over the world. There, there are always aftershocks, right? If I understand it right, there are, there are always, I mean, if we've had recent ones in the U.S., out in California, we had one in uh, Utah not too long ago, and of course you hear about them all over the world. Sure. But there are always big aftershocks, right? 
Not necessarily always um, big ones, but there's, oh, yeah, us right. there's usually aftershocks of some sort. Uh, most of the time we think of the, the, first, the first one as being the largest. However, in the New Madrid seismic zone, that wasn't necessarily the case. The largest one, uh, they believe, was actually in February and not in December. Hmm. So. Remind, speaking of all the damage we see from all these aftershocks, I've heard, and in the books, and the research I think bears this out, but maybe you can confirm this for me, people say that after the 1811, after 12 earthquakes, they actually, the Mississippi River briefly ran backwards, and that they saw waterfalls, and there was dramatic land changes down there, which kind of shows the power of the earthquakes. Sure. What, do, what do you know about that? So yeah, there were dramatic land changes, and, and the Mississippi running backward is kind of an, an odd misnomer. There was areas that actually raised up. Uh, that were under the Mississippi River. So it was like building a, a, a dam there as the water's trying to flow. It was, it was trying to fill up and, and it began to back up. Obviously, if you're sitting there in a boat in the river, it feels like you're going upstream yeah. from what you were earlier. As soon as the water got high enough, however high that was, and it be, you know, began to breach over that uplifted area, it began to cascade down and, and cut through the soft sediment really quickly, that would be, I'm sure that's probably what they considered to be the waterfalls. And it did probably didn't last very long, more probably just a day or so before it all ran, you know, created a new channel as it cut. So the other thing I heard was that this subsidence of the uplift of the land that mm -hmm. blocked the river temporarily actually created Real Foot Lake. So the, True? So uh, well, the uplift, you know, it, it, many areas uh, down there, it would be uplifted in some areas and subsided in other. Mm -hmm. So subsidence uh, there along where Roofoot Lake is, is what created the lake there. You can go look where the trees were, were sunk down. And so, so some areas get raised up, some areas get dropped down. That's pretty incredible, though. That Realfoot Lake is huge. It's like 15, 20,000 acre lake. It is a big lake. And it was not there before the earthquakes, right? So, not to my knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I think that's what the history books right, said. But that's, that's pretty incredible. It shows the power of the earthquakes, correct. I think. So anyway, I just wanted to ask about that because that's what I had read. I wanted, what was the other thing I wanted to mention? Oh, I want to remind everybody. Uh, we've been at it for a while. Great. Glad you're still with us. For those of you just joining us, um, we're coming to you from the State Emergency Management Agency headquarters in Jefferson City. My name is Jeff Briggs. I'm the earthquake program manager here. And I'm happy to be joined by Boot Pierce of the Missouri Geological Survey, a geologist. He told me not to call him an expert, but he obviously is an expert when we're talking about the uh, New, Madrid, uh, New Madrid seismic zone earthquakes. So and let me remind you again, we want you to sign up for the ShakeOut Earthquake Drill. We're, we're timing this Facebook uh, live stream and to talk about the history of the New Madrid seismic zone. We want you to understand the potential impact and the power of it and the damage it may cause because you gotta know what to do in advance. And the best way to learn what to do in advance is to actually practice it. And we have a shakeout earthquake drill. That's what we call it, the shakeout drill, coming up in just a couple weeks on October 15th. You can register for that drill. It's just a one minute way we can all practice together this drop, cover, and hold on technique to prepare yourself. Go to shakeout.org and register for the shakeout drill. Um, we've already got over 300,000 people just in Missouri signed up. There are millions signed up both in the Midwest and around the country. If you sign up tonight, I'll get to that question in just a moment, Katie. If you sign up tonight and uh, message us with a screenshot of your completed shakeout registration, you, will, you can tell us what you want. We will mail you either this comic book, brand new off the presses, talks about the stories about uh, people recovering from earthquakes, this handy dandy portable no battery flashlight or a deck of playing cards where you can learn about earthquake facts while you play cards. Please sign up for the shakeout and let us know that you did. We'd be happy to send you one of these items. Okay, another question. All right, yeah, we have another question from Megan. She's asking, true or false, is it better to be outside away from power lines rather than inside? She said that she remembers in, in in the West, it's encouraged to go away from buildings if possible. Okay, um, the question is, and I'm sorry, I forgot the name. This is Megan. Megan, yeah. sorry, Megan. If it's true or false to be outside away from power lines rather than inside. Is it better to be outside away from power lines rather than inside? Um, what's, and I can't answer that question exactly because the best place to be is a place where debris is not going to fall on you. 
and unfortunately you don't have the luxury to choose where you're going to be. This is what makes it unique with earthquakes. In a tornado, you can choose where you're going to be. You've got time to get to a shelter. If it's a flood, you've got a chance to go to higher ground. In an earthquake, you're going to be wherever you're going to be. If you know to drop cover and hold on and to avoid falling debris, you're in good shape. If you are outside in a wide open area away from power lines and anything else, I'd say that's a great place to be. You're pretty lucky to be in that place in an earthquake. Still, go ahead and drop cover and hold on just in case. If you're inside, well, drop cover and hold on because that's, that's where you are when the shaking starts. I hope that's, that's the best answer I've got. Do you have anything other than that? No, I think <laughs> outside's about the best. Yeah. I have a question for you, Boo. Okay. Um, it's from Sarah. She asks, will Jefferson City have major damage since the river runs through town? Uh, if I remember, it's, um, we've got a Mercalli intensity scale. I, I think uh, Katie's going to try to put that up uh, as she can. Um, it's, I, I don't know exactly what the USGS is showing on the, on the intensity scale for Jefferson City. Um, it's definitely, definitely not what you, would, what you would think of if you're looking at southeast Missouri along the Mississippi River. Um, if you can imagine that, that wave, those, those earthquake waves have to travel <laughs> up to Mississippi. Uh, and I don't, and before they can come up to Missouri, so, so the, uh, I can't imagine that it would have major damage. However, Jefferson City does have a lot of unreinforced masonry. There's probably going to be a lot of cracks, cracked buildings, and, and maybe some falling, falling debris from this, those as well. Thank you. Um, yeah, the question from Sarah was, uh, would, how would Jefferson City be impacted? That reminds me, I wanted to ask and get a little clarification. We're throwing around terms like uh, magnitude and intensity. Magnitude, and I'm going to start it off, but certainly going to turn it over to the expert. Magnitude is how you measure the energy underground. And it's, and there's, is it a one to 10 scale or a, how does that give, give us an idea of what, what it is and, and how strong each of those levels okay. are. Okay. So, so magnitude, magnitude actually measures the, the size of the largest wave. So it's a, how big is the, is the, the earthquake wave that's coming through? Intensity is a little bit different and intensity measures the amount of damage. So intensity can be very subjective. An intensity in the boot heel would be expected to be much higher than it is here. However, a, an earthquake of say a magnitude 7.5, that's the size of the earthquake. That's the largest wave that, that actually comes from the earthquake. The intensity is going to vary depending on where you're at. Intensity is used by, by folks like the insurance agencies, by planning, uh, county commissioners, all state, state planners, to try to get an idea on how much damage to expect if certain earthquakes you know, of certain sizes were to occur. Yeah. So if you've got a magnitude, like, like say a magnitude 5, if you're right on top of that magnitude 5, you're probably going to feel it quite a lot. Correct. But, a, but, a, but if you're a magnitude 5 and you're 100 miles away, the intensity, or how much you're feeling it, is going to be a lot up on top of it, but it's going to be very little exactly. hundred miles away. Exactly. So the magnitude doesn't change, but the intensity does. Depending, depending on where on you're how, at. Depending right. on how far you're and away. They've even talked about the, the, the intensity in St. Louis can vary quite a bit, just depending on where that earthquake is along in the New Madrid seismic zone. If it's in central Arkansas, that's one thing versus a, an earthquake up here in the northern part of the... Uh, northern part of the seismic zone. Thank you for that. And intensity, and the other thing I think that matters is intensity is, um, it can, it, because there's depth to an earthquake, right? That you, you could have one earthquake that's 20 miles down and one that's one mile down. So the intensity or how much it's felt is going to be a lot more for a shallow one, right? That, that's true. And then also you have to, you have to look at the, we were talked earlier about the soft sediments. So uh, a, uh, you know, solid rock versus being built on soft sediments, you'll have more shaking associated with, with the softer sediments. Question, Katie. Yes. So, Claire, I believe this may be your daughter. Claire. Ah, it, it probably is. Hello, yeah. Claire. Yeah. Um, she's asking if something can be dense in historic brick buildings to make them sturdier in the case of an earthquake. Good question. Yes, they can be uh, seismically retrofit, reinforced. Um, um, Unfortunately, it's kind of expensive to do that, and it's like, it's like anything else. Um, um, 
brick buildings can have reinforcement put to them, but uh, it, it's kind of expensive to do. So a few people do that, a lot of people do not. Uh, the other thing that happens is that some, there are codes, there are you know, laws, local laws in place that sometimes require people to uh, reinforce their buildings or to, when they build new buildings to uh, build them up to certain codes that might withstand earthquakes. But those codes are in place in some places and not in place in other places. So uh, although it would be great if every building were reinforced, um, it's kind of expensive to do and unfortunately there are so many thousands of unreinforced masonry, old brick buildings in, in the state, that most of them are unreinforced and are probably going to stay that way, at least for the foreseeable future. Uh, this sure. would probably be for Boo. Um, Ashley's asking about her sister. She lives, her sister lives in Cape, and so she's wondering if a big one hit as in the New Madrid seismic zone, if she would be done so. If she would be what? Dunzo. If she, so Ashley's asking if her sister in Cape would be Dunzo. Well, I hope <laughs> not because my parents live in Cape. So that was where I was born and raised. Um, Cape Dorado ob obviously would, would feel the impact uh, from, from being in that Boot Hill area. Just like anything else that we talked about, you, you, know, you would expect damage to unreinforced masonry. Uh, when you start, you're, you're right on the edge, the northern edge of the embayment right there. Uh, so uh, you've got soft sediments along the river south, south of Cape Girardeau. When you get down right in that, that floodplain, um, you would expect to, see, expect to see damage as well. And there's going to be damage from shaking. shaking. We have another one from Cindy, actually. Okay. Yeah, this is probably for you. The New Madrid Fault is long. Can you narrow where the epicenter of the quake may be? Absolutely not. Uh, uh, we've looked at quakes. If you, if you look at the, 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 uh, the chart up here, you can see where the earthquakes have occurred over the years. Um, if you look at a typical year, we have somewhere between 100, 200 earthquakes along the, in the New Madrid seismic zone. They occur... Uh, at different places, it's wherever the energy builds up in the, in the fault system at the time. Thank you. The question was about can we pinpoint where in the New Madrid zone it's going to occur, and I guess that's a hard no. That's a hard <laughs> 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 Okay, I want to I uh, remind everybody, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're here at the, uh, at the headquarters of the State Emergency Management Agency in Jefferson City talking about the earthquake risk and encouraging everybody to sign up for our upcoming earthquake drill coming up October 15th. It's called the Shakeout Earthquake Drill. In case we already haven't had 100 people send in messages, I don't know if we have or not, but send us a message. Sign up at shakeout.org. Send us a message with a screenshot of your completed registration and you will win. Tell us, just give us your address and tell us which one of the three you want. You want this cool comic book? Would you like a deck of playing cards with earthquake facts on every card? Or would you like a battery-free, crank it and use it light that is awesome to have in the days following an earthquake when you may not have power? We hope you sign up for the ShakeOut. Please, uh, please let us know and we'd be happy to send one of these things to you. So. Let me remind you of a couple of things. Do we have any more questions now? We do have one oh. from Jim, actually. Okay. Uh, this is probably for Boot. Um, I live in a small town about five miles from the Missouri River, not far from Kansas City. We are close to the river, and the soil here is extremely sandy. What could we expect if it does? Um, from, from estimates that I've, I've saw from the U.S. Geological Survey, as you start getting further and further west in Missouri, the, damage is, the damage dies off rather quickly. I mean, it's uh, obviously liquefaction uh, is, a, is an issue for soft sediments, uh, saturated sediments down in the Boot Hill along the Mississippi for sure. But, but I've never seen anything from the U.S. Geological Survey that shows that damage extending real far up into the Missouri River. Um, that's not to say, you know, that something, but, but I've never seen anything estimated for that. Thank you. Um, this reminds me, too, speaking of going out to Kansas City, we, and we talked about how important it is for people outside of the zone to be prepared to assist if needed as well. Um, the question I get sometimes is why is the New Madrid seismic zone where it is? Because we have tectonic plates some people know about, mm -hmm. you know, a bunch, what about a dozen of them, 10 or 12 of them, and 
they're constantly shifting and typically those earthquake hot spots are at the plate at those borders of those tectonic plates and that's like the west coast of the u.s correct so correct. but we have one here in the middle of the country that is not on a tectonic plate do we have any idea why a seismic zone formed here so yeah we we we, we understand how it formed at one point in time we're talking about a, a rift zone uh, we had the continent was over a, an area that was that was trying to, to break the continent apart uh, and in doing so, it fractured up, cracked up the rocks, and, and busted them up, created the fault zone, the seismic zones through there. And, it, and it, if it would have succeeded, it would have been a plate boundary. However, what has happened is it, it didn't happen. Um, either the plate moved on over the, the area that was trying to break it up, or the energy that was, was producing the, the materials pushing up, the magma and all that was pushing up from below, died down, the energy just wasn't there, so it failed. Um, we see this, we see something very similar in Northeast Africa right now with the African Rift Zone, um, and it's slowly but surely there, it's created the Gulf of Aden, the Red Sea. If it had succeeded, that's what we would expect to have seen today, however it failed. So that's how we end up with earthquakes in the middle of a, in the middle of a plate. Uh, it it's, is in the middle of a plate, but in reality, at some point in time, it almost was the edge of a, of a plate. Some of these places along these tectonic plate boundaries have volcanoes too, right? There are Cor some places that have both volcanoes and earthquakes. Correct. But there's nothing volcanic about ours, is there? No, there is nothing volcanic about ours. There is, there is, some, um, there is some volcanic rocks that down deep, but, but there's nothing. Volcan volcanoes are not what's driving our, the New Madrid seismic zone. Okay. Um, let me, uh, let me re reiterate a few points and then we'll see if we have any questions and then we'll wrap it up. So, uh, thank you all for attending so far. Let me remind you of a few things. Um, when we know we live in an active earthquake zone, which we do here, especially in southeast Missouri, but it will be felt throughout much of Missouri, there are two things you can do. You can prepare now so that when shaking starts, you'll be ready. That means looking around your environment. Uh, looking around your school or your home or your business and making sure things that might fall on you are either removed or secured. If there are heavy objects near your bed, for example, either hook them to the wall, if it's an old bookcase maybe, or move it to a lower shelf. Easy stuff like that that can really help you. So look around and make sure things are secured or removed because remember, it's debris, it's falling debris that is the big hazard in an earthquake. So if we know about preparation and, and moving heavy objects in advance, that's wonderful. Because um, as we discussed earlier, earthquakes are unique among natural disasters here in Missouri and in the Midwest in that they occur without warning. So take these steps right away. Prepare before the shaking starts and you'll really have a leg up on you and your family being safe. The other thing you can do is know what to do when the shaking does start. And that's what we're going to practice in our shakeout earthquake drill coming up October 15th. And that is the drop, cover, and hold on method. Very simple, one minute thing to do. Drop to the ground before the shaking knocks you over. Wherever you are, drop to the ground and then look for something to cover up with. If, if there's a table or a desk or something like that nearby and you can get under it, fantastic. If you can't, at least drop down and cover yourself up. Protect your head and your neck as best you can. So drop, cover, and then hold on to whatever's protecting you until the shaking stops. So if you've taken those two steps, if you've prepared your environment in advance, and then if, you've, uh, if you know about drop, cover, hold on, and you're ready to do it when the shaking starts, then that's fantastic, and that's the thing to do. If you can prepare an emergency kit, like Claire suggested earlier, then that's another great thing you can do in advance. So. Um, we hope you will join us for the ShakeOut Earthquake Drill. Let me remind you one more time. Um, go to shakeout.org. Easy to do. It takes one minute to register. Register yourself, your family, your group. We would love to have you join us. We're over 3,000 strong, 300,000 strong already just in Missouri and many, many more millions if you count all the Midwestern states and around the world. So we would love to have you join us. If you join right now during this live stream, um, please message us a uh, picture of your completed registration and we will give you one of these cool items. Just tell us what you want, we'll mail it to you.
So, unless there are, oh, we have more questions. Wonderful. Katie, what you got? Cindy is asking where she can check on a daily basis to see what's going on in the New Madden segment zone. Ah, boot. Um, a couple places that you can you can check. You can actually get an app for your phone from the and it's uh, it, it's not necessarily an app. Uh, the U.S. Geological Survey you set a criteria for where where you want, so you can set it for the imagined seismic zone, and it will send you a notice every time that there is an earthquake uh, in that seismic zone. You can set the scale so you don't get all the little ones and twos. Uh, if you if you don't want them, uh, you can also go to the U.S. Geological's uh, Geological Survey's webpage. They have a, a link there to e uh, all the earthquakes. Uh, it's under natural hazards. And then finally, you can also go to a webpage out of the University of Memphis. It's the Center for Earthquake Research and Instruction, I believe, uh, in the University of Memphis, and they have a uh, ongoing uh, record of all of the earthquakes shows not only where the earthquakes what they what they size they are but also has a map showing where they are located so you can go to any of those three three locations that is that is a great question thank you for that I'm glad you asked because I, I should have mentioned that and that's a, those are great resources I've got this thing I just go to USGS US Geological Survey that is the gold standard for earthquake information so I, I have, I've got a thing on my computer where it's like USGS latest earthquakes is how I found it when I Googled it. Okay. It's got a map that shows little dots, all the earthquakes that popped up today, the last seven days. It's super easy to read and it's kind of fun to keep track of stuff. And you can sign up for alerts where you get an email or a text whenever an earthquake happens in your area. So that USGS latest earthquakes feature is really neat and really easy to use and you don't have to have a smartphone to use it. At, if there are no other questions, I want to thank you all for your time today. I've learned a lot from Boot, and I, and I've, I hope I've encouraged you all to sign up for the ShakeOut. Uh, thank you all for your time, and it's been great talking with you, and uh, stay safe, everybody. Good night. <laughs>